the New South and the West, 1865 to 1900. The Myth of the New South, the Lost Cause. Politics in the South after the Civil War was much the same as before. Many white Southerners discuss the Civil War as a lost cause, nostalgically romanticizing wealthy, cotton-growing plantations in an area of white supremacy and race-based slavery. While white Southerners were marching backwards toward an idealized past, they were at the same time projecting an image of progress in economics and technology. The New South after the Civil War, the South was in shambles with its social, political, and economic systems broken. The region needed a new vision. The New South, envisioned by Henry Woodfin Grady and a number of other Southerners, involved the introduction of industry and diversification of agriculture and manufacturing. Grady, the editor of the Atlanta Constitution, pictured a perfect democracy of farms and industries. However, the New South still assumed that white Southerners could remain in control and that black Southerners must accept a state of political, social, and economic inferiority. Textile mills. During the Civil War, the South had suffered from a lack of manufacturing centers. This change in the New South with factories and textile mills springing up in record numbers before the end of the century. By 1900, the Southern textile industry produced more cotton fabric than New England, the former leading producer. The growth of this industry provided jobs with low wages and attracted former farm workers, as well as women and children from subsidized farming communities. Such jobs provided opportunities for mostly white workers and mill owners sought to encourage a sense of community and try to prevent the growth of labor unions. The tobacco industry. The rise of the tobacco industry is due to the Duke family in Durham, North Carolina. Washington Duke was able to produce 25,000 pounds of tobacco annually by 1872. His son, James Buchanan Duke, spent money on advertising and perfected mechanized mass production of, cig of cigarettes due to cigarette rolling machines. His primary competitors would agree to join forces with him, and in 1890, Duke bought out most of them, creating the American Tobacco Company, and would control 90% of cigarette production. If the name sounds familiar, Duke University. Railroads of the pre-war South were not the same gauge, making it difficult to link the lines across the South. A post-war railroad construction boom promoted commercial agriculture and industry in the South during Reconstruction and in the period of the New South, uniform gauges and connections to major trunk lines in the North linked Southerners to the rest of the nation. Northern Interest, however, owned the major Southern railroads in 1899 and most of the products flowing northward were raw materials to be processed by northern industry or shipped elsewhere by northern merchants. In other words, the South was becoming a colony of the North. Other new industries. The Coca-Cola soft drink industry would spring up in Atlanta, Georgia, and become an important economic aspect of the South. Railroads, although the New South fostered growth in manufacturing, Agriculture still reigned and cotton was still king. The reconstruction of the South and its rail lines improved the shipping of crops to market and the introduction of the refrigerated rail car allowed crops to ship farther without spoiling. Southern railroad construction boomed in the 1880s, tying the section together and stimulating the rise of the interior cities. Birmingham Steel Coal mining provided jobs along the Appalachian Mountains, and as it grew into a steel milk making city, Birmingham, Alabama became known as the Pittsburgh of the South. With the expansion of southern towns and industry in general, population growth also impacted the lumber industry as more Americans sought to construct new houses and businesses. The Redeemers were a small group of Democrats known by the Redeemers, were in charge of the South, and they gave themselves credit for saving the South from the Yankee carpet battles, thus redeeming the South. 
The failings of the New South. Southern poverty. The old plantation system gave way to tenant farmers or sharecropping. Farmers worked land they did not own and traded a set percentage of their annual yield to the right to work the field the next season. Cash in the South was lacking, so credit was the only way tenant farmers survived. By 1900, an estimated 70% of farmers did not own land they worked. Sharecropping and crop lien systems undermined the economic opportunities for poor white and black Americans alike. Racism persisted and helped keep these groups from working together to escape multi-generational cycles of poverty. The crop lien system was an arrangement made between the black farmer and a merchant who sometimes charged up to 60% interest on the futures of the farmer's crop. The tenant farmers paid cash rent to the landowner and then was free to choose and manage his own crop and free to choose where he'd live. The tenant farming system resulted in significant damage to the South. Without ownership of the land, tenant farmers were required to grow high yield crops in high demand. This drained the land of nutrients vital for the future seasons. It also undermined sharecroppers or tenants' ability to grow their own foods to eat or sell, forcing families to purchase food from local merchants and leading to further debt. In addition, the increased use of fertilizers put the land at greater risk. When the land was depleted, tenant farmers moved to another field. In sharecropping, sharecroppers generally gave up to 50% of the crop to landlords. It forced Southern blacks to be more economically dependent on whites. Landlords typically owned stores where tenant farmers had to shop. A landowner dictated the crop and provided the sharecropper with a place to live, as well as the seeds, tools, and return for a share of the harvested crop. Hence, sharecroppers were perpetually in debt to the landowner. Share tenancy is where the farm worker chose the crop he would plant and brought his own supplies. Then he gave a share of the crop to the landowner. This map shows the sharecropping and tenancies between 1880 and 1900 and the percentage of farms in which were not owned by the farmers who worked them. Falling cotton prices. After the Civil War, farmers from the South grew more cotton and it dominated between 1877 and 1900. Railroad construction allowed farmers to plant more cotton, where the region became an importer of food. After record-breaking explosions of supply led to catastrophic decline in prices, the more cotton farmers grew, the less money they made. The cash-poor economy meant credit dominated. Cotton was the only commodity easily converted into cash and so became the only accepted for credit. So it was often used as collateral on loans. The web of credit extended from farmers to local merchants and then also to city merchants. George Washington Carver. Farmers were looking to diversify instead of depending entirely on cotton. And this was due to the efforts of George Washington Carver. Carver was a scientist at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama and promoted the growing of such crops as peanuts, sweet potatoes, and soybeans. His work played an important role in shifting Southern agriculture towards a more diversified space. It allowed the state of Alabama to really abandon cotton and become known as the peanut state. In 1916, Carver was made a member of the Royal Society of the Arts in England, one of only a handful of Americans at this time to receive this prestigious honor. Carver's promotion of peanuts gained him the most notice. In 1920, the United States peanut farmers were being undercut by low prices on imported peanuts from China. In 1921, peanut farmers and industry representatives planned to appear at a congressional hearings to ask for a tariff. Based on the quality of Carver's presentation at the, their convention, they asked the African-American professor to testify on the tariff issue before the Ways and Means Committee of the House of Representatives. Due to segregation, it was highly unusual for an African-American to appear as an expert witness at Congress representing European-American industry and farmers. 
But due to his expert testimony, the Ford McCumber Tariff of 1922 was passed, including one for on imported peanuts. Carver's testify to Congress made him widely known as a public figure. Race relations during the 1890s, disenfranchising African Americans. African Americans born during the Reconstruction period after the Civil War, who had not lived through the dehumanization of slavery uh, and were more likely to have access to education, tended to be more assertive and immediate in their demands for equality. Although their efforts had some positive results, a wave of violent anti-African American sentiment ran rampant in the 1890s South, especially among young white Southerners. Many white Southerners viewed the education of African Americans as a danger to the social order and felt it must be stopped to keep black Southerners in their place. That is, in a state of social, political, and economic subservience, even compared with poor white farmers. The Republican Party. Prior to disenfranchisement, blacks' participation in politics in the South was active and influential. They joined the Republican Party and voted Republican. After Reconstruction, a movement to reduce or eliminate black vote in the South began in the 1880s. The question facing white Democratic legislatures in the South was, how can you legally disenfranchise blacks without violating the 15th Amendment? The U.S. Constitution allows states to determine the eligibility of the electorate, so laws would have to be passed that legally would apply to all races, but were used to eliminate the black Republican vote. Here are several of the plans. First, the Mississippi Plan. It was a series of amendments to the state constitution of Mississippi that would set the pattern of disenfranchisement, and nine more states would follow and enact it in 1890. It required a resident for voting two years in the state and one year local election districts. And this was specifically aimed at African American tenant farmers who are in the habit of moving each year in search of better economic opportunities. The second part of the plan said if you had committed certain crimes, you could not vote. And the last part, in order to vote, people had to pay all taxes on time, including the poll tax. Disenfranchisement included a variety of measures such as complicating the registration voting process as well as instituting the secret ballot. The most commonly form of disenfranchise was the poll tax. A tax imposed on voters is a requirement for voting. Most Southern states have imposed poll taxes after 1900 as a way to disenfranchise black people. The measures also restricted the white vote. So then comes the grandfather clause, a rule that required potential voters to demonstrate that their grandfathers had been eligible to vote, used in some Southern states after 1890 to limit the black electorate, as most black men's grandfathers had been slaves. By keeping them from voting as time passed, now these men's children and their grandchildren would be banned from voting in the future. Race relations remained fluid between 1877 and the early 1890s. Many African Americans voted and held office. Segregation was the rule in churches, schools, and some organizations in some public places. But whites and blacks conducted business with each other and otherwise maintained cordial relations. It was with the civil rights cases of 1883 that the Supreme Court asserted that the 14th Amendment applied only to cases in which the state infringed on the rights of African Americans. Therefore, it was perfectly legal when an individual did so. New segregation legislation focused on railroads and providing separate but equal facilities. In 1892, Homer Plessy, an octroon, who was a person of seven-eighths white and one-eighth black ancestry, governments assigned children of mixed unions to the ethnic group which the dominant group is perceived as being subordinate. So a person's race was really determined by 
not by color of skin, but by blood. That he had deliberately violated Louisiana's Separate Car Act of 1890, which required equal but separate train car accommodations for white and non-white passengers. During his trial, Plessy's lawyers argued that the state law, which required East Louisiana Railroad to segregate trains, had denied him his rights under the 13th and 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, which provided for equal treatment under the law. However, the judge, John Howard Ferguson, ruled that Louisiana had the right to regulate railroad companies while they operated within the state boundaries. In 1896, the United States Supreme Court took up the case and ruled seven to one that separate but equal was constitutional in the Plessy v. Ferguson case. The lone dissenting judge, John Marshall Harlan, argued that even if many white Americans in the late 19th century considered themselves socially superior to Americans of other races, the United States Constitution was colorblind and could not permit any classes among citizens in matters of civil rights. Here's the irony. Harlan was born into a slave-holding family from Kentucky. This brought about the Jim Crow laws due to this ruling of segregation in the South. Jim Crow laws spread throughout the Southern states. Legal segregation became the norm, and racial stereotypes and tensions only seemed to grow more pronounced. In North Carolina, in Wilmington, African Americans composed the majority of the 20,000 city residents. In 1894 and 1896, they joined with Republicans and populists to choose their own slate of elected officials, a step that the minority white Democrats found unacceptable. On November 10, 1898, more than 2,000 white men and boys rampaged through the town, destroying African-American-owned businesses and killing as many as 100 African-Americans. They then forced elected officials out of office and appointed their own slate of officers. While raising four children, Wells sustained her commitment to sending racial and gender discrimination. African Americans responded in different ways. Some fought back against the racism in the area and faced lynch mobs or legal punishment as a result. Others left the South and sought opportunities elsewhere and still others remain and adopted a solitary lifestyle to keep from being noticed. Yet still others who remained sought solace and support within African-American community groups and organizations. Unexpectedly, some African-American entrepreneurs actually benefited from segregation due to the demand of certain services for the black community. An outspoken African-American act activist was Ida B. Wells. She came to the public attention when she was denied a seat on a railroad car due to a race. She filed suit and won, but this was overturned on appeal to the Tennessee Supreme Court. From this event, she founded her life's calling and helped fund, found the NAACP in 1909. Wells also fought for justice as a journalist and was the editor of a newspaper, Memphis Free Speech. Women's suffrage was another one of her passionate causes. Booker T. Washington. Up From Slavery was the autobiography of Booker T. Washington. Born into slavery, Washington walked over 400 miles just to attend a private school. He slept under the boardwalk and cleaned the one-room schoolhouse to pay for his tuition. He had become the founder of the Tuskegee Institute, a historically black vocational training school. He went on to become the nation's most prominent African-American leader. Washington gave a speech in Atlanta known as the Atlanta Compromise. He was, he was the foremost black educator in the 1890s, and he believed that race should first achieve economic stability, and that would ultimately provide for the advancement of social status. Washington urged blacks to accommodate themselves to segregation in a speech called the Atlanta Compromise, accepting segregation and disenfranchisement for African Americans in exchange for white assistance in education and job training. Webb Dubois was an advocate of civil rights, a fierce advocate for black education and civil rights, 
W.E.B. Du Bois was born in Massachusetts and would become the first African American to graduate from Harvard University. He worked for immediate acceptance of an equal status of African Americans with their Anglo neighbors. Du Bois challenged Washington. He became disillusioned about Southern whites aiding blacks. In his book, The Soul of Black Folks, Du Bois asserted that black Americans were divided between their status as Americans and as African Americans in a state of double consciousness and attacked the stance of accommodation expressed by Washington. He was a member of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, which started out as an interracial organization. Founded in 1910, dedicated to restoring African American political and social rights. Although Washington, Wells, and Dubois sought to promote equality for African Americans, they often disagreed on the timing and approaches that should be used to achieve their goals. The next section we're going to now cover is the New West. The settling of the New West, the Western landscape. Between 1870 and 1900, Americans settled more land in the United States than had occupied before the Civil War. About a third of the American population lived west of the Mississippi River by 1900. The Great Plains offered little rainfall and few rivers or trees which seemed useless to the pioneer. They were used to log cabins, rail fences, as well as traditional methods of tilling the soil. This was also called the Great American Desert. White settlers believe there is no way one can make a living out there. This, of course, would change with the coming of the Transcontinental Railroad and in the subduing of Native Americans in the latter part of the 19th century. The duality of the West. The American West was, one, on one hand, became symbolic of both economic opportunity and individual liberty. On the other hand, it came to represent a region of irresponsibility, lawlessness, and economic and cultural exploitation, especially of Native Americans. The Migratory Stream Native Americans and Hispanic American populations already lived in the West. With time, they were joined by migrants that included white Americans, African Americans, and Native Americans from the eastern portions of the United States. Immigrants from Northern Europe and Canada tended to move into a the Northern Plains regions where they found fertile soil. In addition to Anglo-Americans, Mexican, South Americans, Chinese, and European immigrants tended to move into the Southwestern region. After the Civil War, African Americans by the thousands and former slaves migrated west to seek new opportunities in an area known for the availability of land. Benjamin Papp Singleton, played a pivotal role in promoting migration of former slaves to the American West, especially to Kansas. These freedmen were known as exodusters because they made their exodus from the South. This migration died out in the 1880s as many exodusters were unprepared for the harsh living conditions of the Plains. To employ these out-of-work farmers, the Army created two colored cavalry units in the West known as Buffalo Soldiers. By 1890, around 520,000 African Americans lived in the West, and the African Americans made up about 25% of the cowboys in the Texas region. Western Mining The gold rush of 1849 established a pattern in the search of precious materials. Gold, or another valuable material, were discovered. A rush of prospectors flat to the area, businesses followed to provide the needs of the migrants, and prospectors moved on to a newer find when the mine panned out. Corporate mining. In the late 19th century, individual miners were replaced by large companies using equipment from the Industrial Revolution. High pressured water cannons scoured the land of topsoil and deep shaft mining drilled caverns into the earth to search for ore. Farmers in the Central Valley in California complained that their farms and the area's fertile lands were damaged by industrial mining practices. In 1878, they formed the Anti-Debris Association, 
As a result, in 1884, after trying a variety of methods to address the concerns, federal judge Lorenzo Sawyer ruled in the farmer's favor in Woodruff v. North Bloomfield Gravel Mining Company. Mining Boom Towns Towns became known as boom towns due to the rapid growth that sprang up in areas of the Southwest around mining operations. Nevada's Virginia City, created by the Comstack Lode, added theaters, churches, newspapers, schools, libraries, railroads, and organized law enforcement. Tombstone, Arizona, another example, evolved around a silver mining site. Deadwood in the Dakota Territory was another example of a boom town. Towns that served the mines, such as San Francisco, Sacramento, and Denver, became important commercial centers. Such towns tended to have a primary male population, the few women in the camps had limited employment options, with prostitution being the largest source of jobs. Saloons were prevalent in mining camps, violence was frequent and often associated with ethnic and racial differences. Personal violence was less common than collective acts of violence. A large portion of immigrants and immigrant groups, including the Chinese and Mexicans, suffered from discrimination in many southwest boom towns. In California, hostility to foreigners took the form of a miners' tax of $20 a month on all foreign-born miners, and political pressure from western states moved Congress to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. The Comstock Loan The famous Comstock Loan produced a large amount of gold and silver in the area. In the neighborhood, of $340 million of gold and silver by 1890, and would be responsible for Nevada entering the Union by 1864. It was more than 50 feet wide and thousands of feet deep. Like other mining operations, it attracted settlers. Due to the, all these boom towns, the population boom across the Southwest led to Colorado's immense as a state in 1876, but the partisan nature of the process hindered additional territorial requests for statehood. Many Democrats were reluctant to create states out of predominantly Republican-leaning regions. However, when the Republican Party gained control of both houses of Congress in 1888, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Washington became states in 1889. Idaho and Wyoming gained statehood in 1890, and Utah became a state in 1896. Finally, 1907, Oklahoma, the former Indian Territory, became a state, and Arizona and New Mexico would officially join the United States in 1912. The Effects of Mining Mining not only stimulated the settlement of the West, but had the impact of economics and politics on the nation as a whole in the late 19th century, where vast amounts of silver was being mined and now competing with the value of gold with the currency, which later became a political issue for both Westerners and the country in the 1880s and 1890s. Life in the West, the cattle boom. After the Civil War, industrial expansion and railroad enlarged the market for Texas beef. Texas became the starting point. The plains of Texas had wild longhorn cattle roaming free. All you had to do was corral them, brand them, and then drive them north. With the near extension of the buffalo came the rise of the cattle industry. The terminus for the cattle drive was whichever rail line was closest. As railways continued to extend west, the destinations of the cattle drive changed. Joseph McCoy made an important decision when he established a northern shipping point for cattle in Abilene, Kansas. The cattle trails. The drive lasted about three months over the Chisholm, Goodnight Loving, Western or Sedalia, and Baxter Spring Trails. Texas this was the starting point. They drove the cattle up the Chisholm Trail to Abilene, Te Tex Kansas. And between 1867 and 1870, one and one and a half million cattle reached Abilene. These cow towns were where the cattle trade simulated urban development 
in these cow towns, but not all thrive. Aveline, Dodge City, Cheyenne, and Ellsworth. The invention of barbed wire fencing by Joseph Glidden in 1873 allowed farmers and ranchers to choose their farms and ranches. The enclosure of lands frustrated small ranchers who depended on open ranges for their livelihood and caused problems for Native American migration patterns. Confiscating claims of land and water boundaries along the ethnic prejudices triggered range wars, violent disruptions between ranchers and farmers. Chicago, gateway to the West and the Western economy. Chicago was serviced by nine railroads and located on Lake Michigan. It has lumber yards, grain elevators, stockyards, and slaughterhouses. It also became a magnet for immigrants seeking jobs. Frank Norris, in his novel, The Pit, said of Chicago that it imposed a domination upon a reach of a country larger than many kingdoms of the old world. It was the meatpacking industry, places like Cincinnati and Chicago, and started not with cattle, but with hogs. Cincinnati was given the nickname Porkopolis in 1850. Chicago slaughtered, butchered 20,000 hogs. Cincinnati, 334,000 each. In 1862, Chicago would displace Cincinnati due to the Civil War and the high demand for pork. It was refrigeration that would make a major impact. The ice cut from Lake Michigan allowed Chicago to transport their pork all the way to the East Coast. But there's no ice in the summer. Gustavus F. Swift experimented with refrigerated rail cars, and his competition was a Philip Armour, who developed refrigerated freight cars that could ship processed meat. With a refrigerated car, Chicago became dominant in the meatpacking corporations. Swift and Armour would branch out, trade with grains and corn, and packing plants in Kansas City in Omaha, and were responsible for processing most of the meat in Chicago. Farming on the Plains The Homesteaders The Homestead Act of 1862 opened up for cultivation the last portion of the Great Plains, providing 160 acres of land free to anyone who could live and plot and farm on it for five years. But restrictions limited uh, to the public land in most settlers of the Great Plains uh, where they had purchased it. Farming in the West required a much larger scale of farming to achieve success. 160 acres was good in the East, but was extremely difficult on the Plains. By 1900, 400,000 families had tried to settle on the Great Plains. The various challenges they faced were many. Families received only 10% of the land. The rest went to railroads, miners, cattlemen, speculators, and state governments. The pioneers in the Great Plains faced all the following problems, scarcity of water that harmed survival and domestic labor, a shortage of trees, which meant there was little wood for housing, and sod houses being plagued by snakes, mice, and insects. The Santa Fe Ring Western settlement was promoted by newspapers, land companies, steamship companies, and most importantly, railroad advertising and promotional campaigns. Migrants flooded into every area of the West. Various ethnic groups established ethnic communities in specific areas in the Southwest. The large infusion of Anglos undermined traditional Hispanic society. They seized millions of acres through fraud and legal manipulation that would be known as the Santa Fe Ring from Mexican families that had worked their land for generations. Commercial farming operations increased as small farmers were unable to compete economically. Several hard winters and a period of drought led to the end of the cattle drives and the open range gave way to being closed. Women in the West. Here we see a woman and her family in the front of their sod house. 
The difficult life on the prairie led to more egalitarian marriages than that were found in other regions of the country. Because women had to play so many roles, women's work included transporting water, often over long distances. Some women farmed land themselves. Married women operated the family farm when their husbands worked elsewhere. Plain settlers, especially women, experienced isolation and loneliness. Communities began to be formed as local populations grew. It was women who worked to form communities by organizing social activities and institutions, such as churches and schools. Women in the West faced the same societal constraints as in the East. However, many women who became widowed in the West assumed control of their land and obtained independence that would not have been allowed back East. The Fate of Western Indians As the line of frontier moved further west, Indians who had been forced west by treaties and congressional decrees once again found Anglo settlers encroaching on land that had been promised to them. Unwilling to move again, they attacked the immigrants as they passed through or attempted to settle their land. In the 1830s, the federal government policy was to separate whites and Indians, moving Native Americans west of the Mississippi River. Expanding white settlement devastated the Native Americans who already were competing with each other for limited resources on the plains. The cause of many Indian deaths on the Great Plains was due to smallpox or starvation or the decimation of the buffalo herds and then, the, of course, the Indians' lack of immunities to new diseases. By the early 1850s, white settlers sought to occupy Indian territory and the land for the railroad further cut into Indian land. The federal government implemented the reservation system to relocate tribes, promising annual provisions in return. Oklahoma State Territory had the greatest percentage of its area as Indian reservation land in the mid-1890s. The Sand Creek Massacre The Cheyenne raided trails near the Sand Creek Reservation. The tribe was ordered off the reservation. They stayed. On November 29, 1864, the Civil War was taking place in the eastern and central United States. Colonel John M. Chivington, and a 700 militiamen attacked a group of Cheyenne and Arapaho women, children, elders, and a few men near the Sand Creek in Colorado. Most of the men were out hunting. Chief Black Kettle attempted to show that the group was peaceful by waving an American and a white flag. However, the militiamen ignored those signals and killed, scalped, and mutilated about 165 Indian women, children, elders, and men. Chivington, a former abolitionist and a Methodist minister, claimed that he and his men had won a victory against 1,000 entrenched Cheyenne warriors. Americans at first hailed him as a hero, until others in the company, such as Captain Celia Soul, reported more truthful accounts of the massacre. A congressional investigation into the event condemned Chivington's actions, but Soul was murdered in Denver, and his murderers were never prosecuted. Spreading Conflict Many Native American groups across the West responded to the Sand Creek Massacre with outrage. Arapaho, Cheyenne, Sioux, and others attacked groups of white settlers. In response, many Confederate military prisoners were recruited to fight the United, for the United States in the West, and Congress established two colored or African-American cavalry regiments that the Cheyenne called Buffalo Soldiers. These soldiers were known for their valor and hard work as they helped fight in the Indian Wars and built infrastructures across the West. They were called Buffalo Soldiers due to the kinky hair that the Native Americans said looked similar to that of the hen of a buffalo. Indian Relocation In 1866, Chief Red Cloud asked the government to stop building forts along the Bozeman Trail. Crazy Horse of the Sioux Nation routed detachment 
led by Captain Fetterman that was sent to defeat them, which would be known as the Battle of 100 Slain. In 1867, a congressional committee recommended that the Indian Peace Commission be formed to remove the causes of the wars and massacres between the United States, the Indian tribes, and the West. Congress decided that the best approach would be to persuade nomadic nations to move to the federal reservations on lands not yet claimed by American settlers. Despite misgivings, the Kiowas, Comanches, Arapaho, and the Cheyenne agreed to move to western Oklahoma at a conference in Medicine Lodge, Kansas in 1867. The Treaty of Fort Laramie of 1868 acknowledged the U.S. defeat in the Great Sioux War in 1868 and supposedly guarantee the Sioux perpetual land and hunting rights in South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. The Western Sioux, the Lakotas, signed the Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868, agreeing to settle in the Black Hills Reservation in the southwest portion of the Dakota Territory. However, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse expected to use the traditional hunting grounds. And even though the Lakota Sioux signed the treaty, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse tribes did not and saw this as not complying. But to the United States, they were part of the Sioux Nation and must comply, regardless that they did not sign it. Grant's Indian policy, whereas many Americans ignored the interest of Native Americans in the West, President Grant argued that they should be treated better and have the right to become Americans. Most Americans disagreed, especially when Native American interests ran up against the economic opportunities pursued by miners, farmers, railroaders, ranchers, and so on. Generals William Tecumseh Sherman and Philip Sheridan's basic attitude towards the Indians can be summed up by the statement allegedly by Sheridan, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Custer and the Sioux. In 1874, miners find gold in the Black Hills and pour into the reservation, violating the Black Hills Reservation of the Sioux. The Sioux and the Arapaho protests. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer is sent to investigate and reports there is gold. The gold brings in more miners and the U.S. offers to purchase the land, but Red Cloud refuses. In 1876 would begin the Great Sioux War. Custer and his troops attacked Sioux hunting parties who fought back against American miners. The Great Sioux War was the United States' largest military campaign in the 1870s or following the end of the Civil War. It lasted 15 months and included 15 battles in the present states of Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, and Nebraska. In June of 1876, Custer makes a series of mistakes. Underestimating the Indian strength, his men and horses exhausted, he split up his regiment, and Custer and his detachment of 210 soldiers moved against a Sioux and Northern Cheyenne and Arapaho encampment along the Little Bighorn River to the Montana Territory, only to find themselves surrounded by more than 2,500 warriors led by Crazy Horse. In the end, Custer and all of his men were killed. Cheyenne women pierced Custer's eardrums to show that he should have listened to the warnings to stay away from their lands. The rest of the dead soldiers of the 7th Cavalry would be scalped, their legs and arms chopped off due to the Sioux belief of not wanting your enemies to chase you in the afterlife. Although the battle was a decisive Sioux victory, it led Grant and the Congress to abandon their more peaceful policies and to send troops and supplies to wage total war against the Sioux and their allies. By the spring of 1877, Crazy Horse and most of the Sioux had surrendered. The Sioux were finally defeated because it was difficult for them to sustain their traditional Indian economy. Last Resistance the near extinction of the buffalo also led to the decline of Native Americans' resistance to a white settlement. Indians used every part of buffalo in some manner, relying on them for subsistence. Demand for buffalo skins following the Civil War caused a dramatic increase in their slaughter. 
A buffalo hunter killed on average 100 a day, taking only their skins. The widespread slaughter, along with the increase in forage with horses, cattle, and sheep, greatly reduced the number of buffalo in the South. The Nez Pierce. Peaceful bands attempting to hold out along the Salmon River in Idaho and eastern Oregon. In 1877, however, Chief Joseph led about 650 Nez Pierce on a 1,300-mile track across Montana in an attempt to reach Canada. U.S. soldiers stopped them just before they reached the border, and Chief Joseph gave a stirring and eloquent speech that highlighted the sense of sorrow inherent in his surrender. In 1886, with the capture of Geronimo, the chief of the Chukawa Apaches, after fighting American forces, the Apache band were dodgingly pursued by the United States Army, about 5,000 troops, for 15 years that singled the end of the Indian Wars. Geronimo agreed to stay on the San Carlos Reservation in Arizona and New Mexico. However, the Apaches that he led and his band were sent to St. Augustine and were imprisoned from April 1886 to May 1887 at Fort Marion, today known as the Castillo de San Marcos. A majority of his band perished due to diseases. Geronimo and what was left eventually moved to Oklahoma, where they learned farming at Fort Sill. Wounded Knee Assimilation Taking in Native American land was considered the first step in requiring Native Americans to adopt white ways. Education and religion were the vehicle for this change, often supplemented by military force. White reformers on the Board of Indian Commissioners believed that Indians should be assimilated by teaching them to be Christians. Off-reservation boarding schools isolated Indian children as they were taught white ways. In 1884, a criminal code made it illegal for Native Americans to practice their tribal religion. In 1888, Wavoka, Jack Wilson, a Piatot in western Nevada, dreamed of a spirit world that included a deliverer who was to come free the Indians and restore their homelands to them. He told others of this dream and urged them to perform a ceremonial dance wearing a ghost shirt. The resulting ghost dance movement spread across much of the West among Native American groups, and U.S. authorities responded in fear. The Last Battle Indian policemen were sent to arrest Sitting Bull after the Sioux Wars. Sitting Bull had spent several years in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, a kind of a circus that featured celebrities of the Old West. Sitting Bull was given as a gift a trick horse that would perform a dance when it heard a gunfire. The Indian soldiers sent to Wounded Knee demanded that the Sioux give up their firearms. They refused. A warrior fires his gun and Sitting Bull is killed instantly on the horse that he was sitting on and the horse begins to dance. The Indians freak out. They had believed that the spirit of Sitting Bull was now in the horse. Now the 7th Cavalry on the hills responded with the cannon and Gatling guns when they heard the gunfire. At the end, at least 150 Sioux men, women, and children were slaughtered. The Indian Wars would officially come to an end with the Battle of Wounded Knee. Although many Americans viewed the Indian Wars as a necessary part of American settlement across the West, a growing number of politicians, religious leaders, and other Americans recognized the horrible treatment of Native Americans. Helen Hunt Jackson's A Century of Dishonor, 1881, called attention to the exploitation of Native Americans' interactions and led to many to seek change in related policies. The Dawes Severity Act of 1887 undermined tribal power by allowing homesteads to white individuals. American settlers and policies forced a large number of Native American nations that lived in the West once again to relocate. The End of the Frontier 
In 1890, the Census Office could no longer find an area that qualified as a frontier line. Previously, it was defined as an area where fewer than two people per square mile resided. In addition, historian Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier thesis shaped the way that many view the experiences, settlement patterns, and the history of the American Southwest. Many agricultural communities in the late 19th century grew disillusioned with the New West. Mechanization of agriculture enabled some farmers to become wealthy, whereas many homesteaders and smaller farmers had to abandon their land and seek wage labor, often as migrant workers. These and other frustrations gave rise to the populist movement in the 1890s.